So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try and um, pull this out as like a secondary form of notation, right? So in fact, I'll just prove this as a, I'll even write that this is a secondary proof, sometimes called an auxiliary proof because it's just on the side, that's what auxiliary means. I want to prove that a squared minus a plus one over a is greater than or equal to one. This is what I'm after, okay? Now, as I said, you can go the calculus um, path with this if you want, but I, I'm, I'm interested in showing you different tools in your toolbox. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of go into drawing some of the tools that we used from the nature of proof. Okay, so buckle up, let's have a go. I said that one of the classic ways to deal with an inequality, right when we started this question, before we were you know, really very far into the proof by mathematical induction, is to get everything onto one side and then prove that it's positive or negative, right? And that's really helpful here because when you have a look at what you get here, a squared minus a plus one over a minus one. Can I prove that this is greater than or equal to zero? Um, what you get here is something which, even though it doesn't look like it, can actually be quite nicely factorized. You might say, that doesn't look like it's nice to factorize at all. But if you look closely, um, it actually works into two very nice, neat pairs, right? If you just have a look at this pairing here and this pairing here, hopefully you have noticed, like I have, that they are um, opposite in sign. One's positive, one's negative, same deal here. And they're off by a factor of a. You've got this is a times bigger than this, uh, and this is a times bigger than this. So there should be some symmetry here you can recognize. So how am I gonna factorize this? So a few ways to do it, but the most obvious way that I see is to take out a value factor of a from the first pairing. So that gives you a minus one, like so. And then for this one, I'm going to take out a factor of one over a, and that gives you, well, just be careful, taking one over a out of this just leaves you with one. And then when you take one over a out of this, you can prove this to yourself by expanding, obviously you get a, right? Does that make sense? Or I should say minus a. One over a times minus a, the a's cancel, leave you with minus one. Okay, so that looks really good because you can see these are just off by a factor of negative one. So in fact, what I can do is, if I change this into a minus one over a there in the middle, um, that will turn this binomial over here into a minus one, just reverses its order. And now I have another common factor. I've got a minus one, which is in common, and then I've got a minus one over a, greater than or equal to zero. You might say, this, is no, this looks no better than what I started with, okay? But I actually think this is quite nice to deal with by exhaustion. In other words, doing cases, right? I can prove in the domain that I'm interested in, which is for a is greater than zero, I can prove quite neatly actually that this um, weird expansion here is always gonna be greater than or equal to zero. It falls out actually quite simply, right? Here's the way that I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna think about three cases, right? Case one, two, and three. Firstly, remembering that a has to be greater than zero, I'm gonna prove um, that this is gonna be true from zero all the way up to one. Now you might say, why one? Why is that important? And the answer is, uh, I didn't put that in the right spot. The answer is, I can see that something happens when a switches over to past one, right? Um, when you go and put in a equals one here, you get one minus one, you get zero. It's kind of like a junction point or a singularity where this thing kind of changes, right? So therefore, I'm gonna say that's the first case. A equals one is the secondary case, and then I just have to look um, after A equals one, right? Can you see that when I combine these domains for each of these cases, they comprehensively, exhaustively cover A is greater than zero. You're going from zero up to one, you handle one, and then you go beyond one, okay? So there are the domains. Then when I think about this, I can say, well, look at each of the different factors in turn. Can we work out what's happening to a minus one? Um, can we know what the sign of that is? Is it gonna be positive, negative? And then how is it gonna combine with a minus one over a? Once I know what's happening to each of those two terms there, I can then work out what happens to the product, namely this thing here. What can I know about its sign? So this is my roadmap, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna consider, oh, this is gonna be really, messy, but let's see if I can do it reasonably quickly for you, okay? Um, I'm going to consider um, each of these different cases, and um, they're really straightforward to think about algebraically. Oh, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> there you go. Oh, except it's so messy. Here we go. Sorry, I'm a bit of a stickler for these things. There we go, I'm happy with that, okay? 
I've got my table set up and if I think about what's happening for each of these, what's going to happen for a minus one, what's going to happen for a um, minus one over a, um, this is going to be pretty straightforward to work out all of my cases, okay? So for starters, uh, let's have a look at when um, a is between naught and one. Okay, when a is between naught and one, so you've got um, fractions like a half, a third, a quarter, right? When you take away one from those, because you have got to be less than one, um, you're definitely going to get something negative. Do you agree with that, right? So long as you're between zero and one, when you take away one, you're going to get a negative value. Satisfied? Okay. Um, when you have a look at a minus one over a, think about this, right? One over a has to be bigger than a. Does that make sense, right? If you've got fractional values in here, right, like a half, a third, a quarter, then one over a is gonna be um, two, three, four. So you're gonna get a, a small fraction over here and then the reciprocal of that is gonna be larger, right? So therefore, this is also going to be negative because you're subtracting a larger number from a smaller number, right? Like a half take away two or a third take away three. They're all gonna be negative, okay? And when you multiply two negative numbers, this is what we get with our product over here, you get a positive, right? Remember what I'm asking for. I want this to be greater than or equal to zero, and that checks out. What about the a equals one case? Well, this is even easier, right? When a is equal to one, this is just gonna be zero. This is also gonna be zero. So therefore their product will be zero. Um, is that going to be greater than or equal to zero? And the answer is yes, it is, because zero is greater than or equal to zero, namely equal, it's a boundary case. And then lastly, when I have a look at a is greater than one, um, I've got the reverse of the original case, right? So as so long as you're bigger than one, a take away one obviously has to be positive because you know, you've got numbers like two, three, four, five. When you take away one, obviously you're not small enough to get down to a negative or to zero, so that's gonna be positive. And same deal here, right? You've got a bigger number out the front and a smaller number because you're getting that um, denominator being larger. So it'd be two take away a half, three take away a third. They're all going to be positive. And of course, when you multiply two positive numbers, you get another positive, right? So that's it. For all of my cases, um, for all cases, um, a minus one times A minus one over A is greater than or equal to zero, which means, therefore, this is um, directly connected to this up here, like so, right? So therefore, I can say that this is going to be true, whoopsie daisy, this is going to be true for the particular domain that I was interested in, what I proved, which is a is greater than zero because those were that's what my um, that's what my three cases covers right. Um, you're okay between naught and one. You're okay at one, and you're okay beyond one as well. Okay. So that was my secondary proof. I can now return to let's uh, let's give this a name. Let's call that one. And over here, I've got a to the k plus one, one over a to the k plus one. So therefore, I'm going to grab this, copy that. Okay, so returning to one, I'm almost ready to tie this up in a nice neat bow. I can say, I've got this. And therefore, I can say that this is going to be greater than or equal to, um, let's give this a name as well. This is two, okay? Um, I can say all of, whoops, you don't rub that out. All of this is unchanged, but this is being multiplied by one from two. You can see how I'm bringing in this result over here, right here. I'm substituting it for something that's greater than or equal to it, right? So therefore, this is, um, i.e., when you multiply by one, that doesn't change this term on the end there, that's it. So I've just proved the k plus one step, uh, or case rather, um, from the k step, that was my assumption. So I can say as required. Finished. <laughs> so now finally I can say true um, for a is greater than zero and n is greater than uh, or rather n's a positive integer. I could say um, n is greater than or equal to one by principle of mathematical induction. And then I can finally exhale. 
So what have we learned from this question? In many ways, just like every other proof by mathematical induction, um, the, the skeleton of it is the same. The basic structure, we test, we assume, we prove. But in both the test and the prove step, I mean the assume step where well, you just state it, right? Um, in both the test and in the prove step for k plus one, um, there were a couple of curveballs, right? We pulled out calculus in the middle of a proof by induction. And that was mainly because of this, um, this characteristic of A. It wasn't just N, like in, in the in integer land, it's pretty unusual to pull out calculus, but it's because of this A being a real number and it being, you know, remaining as an unknown, a variable here that we had to appeal to calculus to even just do the base case. And then when doing the K plus one case, you end up with this unusual result, which we could have applied calculus to all over again, but um, it was just as useful, I think, to, um, and I would say, um, actually easier to deal with because you don't have to um, it doesn't necessitate the solution of a QB polynomial. Um, you, you end up with, with dealing with this by cases, which is actually, even though it looks long, is a fairly straightforward way of doing things, which is why it is still a very useful tool in your mathematical toolbox. I guess what I would suggest is knowing um, how to break up this object into meaningful cases, which are these three over here. That does, does take a little practice. Um, and I knew that this was gonna be a junction point because of where this thing switches over sign. Um, but hopefully you can see why my, my logic holds. So hopefully that makes sense. And you'll be able to have uh, more tools in your toolbox for approaching questions like this one, <laughs> once we get there eventually, when you encounter them in the future.